Good morning, everybody. I know it's bright and early. Good morning, participants in the room, and good morning, participants online, or at least good day, depending on what time of day it may be where you are. Welcome to our CGIR side event on multiple winning solutions to the global food crisis here at the Norman E. Borlaug International Dialogue in Des Moines, Iowa. I'm Marco Ferroni, as some of you may know, your moderator for this discussion. And all of us are aware of what has been termed a perfect storm, that confluence of current challenges to food security that suggests our food systems are not fit for purpose. Not if that purpose is to deliver affordable and healthy diets for all of the people all of the time, while at the same time safeguarding natural resources and mitigating the CO2 equivalent footprint of agri-food systems. The notion of multiple win solutions that we will be exploring in our discussion today arises from systems thinking. Systems thinking that recognizing the, recognizes the interdependence of critical components of agri-food systems and also prioritizes intervention strategies that avoid the unintended consequences of siloed interventions. Our goal today is twofold. First, to learn about both rapid responses and longer-term measures for enhanced food and nutrition security that can help meet more than one goal of food systems transformation or that help to minimize or avoid altogether unwanted trade-offs. And second, to highlight the crucial role of CGIR and partners in the international community strive to both respond to this crisis and make our food systems more resilient for future crises, while at the same time furthering the long-term vision for inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food systems that work for people and the planet alike. Let's, as, and this is my proposal, please uh, proceed with this twofold agenda. And uh, I'm pleased now to begin to call on our eminent speakers to help us uh, through the agenda. We have uh, initially, actually we're a little bit out of luck because uh, the first of our speaker, uh, speakers, Madame Mukeshimana, the um, Rwanda Minister of Agriculture and Animal Resources had to cancel her trip to Des Moines at the last minute, so, so she will not be here, unfortunately which means that we will be immediately shifting to uh, Dr. David Navarro, co-lead Food UN Global Crisis Response Group 2022, and he will be uh, speaking to us in the form of a pre-recorded video. But before we do that, let me just uh, give you a little bit of uh, a preview of the coming attractions. After we hear from David, we will be hearing from uh, Jo Swinnen, I'll introduce Jo at that, at that time, on the CGIR food crisis response, and then we go into our moderated discussion, and I will, of course, uh, introduce the panelists at that uh, stage. We have, luckily, quite a bit of time. We have a hard stop at 8.50, 10 to 9, so that's the time budget that, uh, that we have. With this, uh, allow me to introduce, uh, again, uh, Dr. David Navarro, um, and uh, we will be listening to his video momentarily. Good day, I'm David Nabarro and I'm here to talk about the work of the United Nations Secretary General's Global Crisis Response Group. This was established in March this year and the purpose of the group is to make certain that we do whatever can be done within the United Nations system to reduce any suffering and distress that's associated with ongoing crises and particularly those that have been exacerbated by uh, the war in Ukraine. In fact, many of you will have been aware that food systems have been not working well for people for quite some time and as a result of multiple shocks, uh, many governments have been concerned that they may be uh, failing their people quite badly. Uh, and this became clear, particularly in 2020, uh, 2021, when 
the preparations were being made for the United Nations Food Systems Summit. And what we were hearing from ministers of agriculture, from heads of state and government and others, was that more and more farmers were facing difficulty with producing the food that they would expect to produce uh, because of climate change affecting access to water and affecting also uh, the precipitation that occurs with the result that because of droughts and because of, of water shortages, uh, we were seeing very large numbers of farmers, particularly smallholder farmers, in extreme difficulty. And then on top of that, the COVID-19 pandemic has shocked societies everywhere. It's actually damaged the fabric of society that normally supports poorer people. And the result has been a major, major difficulties uh, for people everywhere, not just because of the virus, but because of the responses that have had to be made to the virus, widening the gap between people who are relatively wealthy and people who are poor and uh, uh, creating uh, very, very grave difficulties for those poorer people. And then the increasing number of conflicts that we've seen in, in recent years have compounded the effects of climate change and the effects of COVID-19 taken together. COVID-19, climate change and conflict uh, were already signalling to many national leaders that things were not well with their food systems uh, and this just got made an awful lot worse by the war in Ukraine uh, with the fact that it was affecting access to food for the 30 plus countries that depend on imports from Ukraine, plus also with the uh, difficulties on the Russia side, uh, access to fertilizer has been affected, uh, particularly potash, but also nitrogen containing fertilizers as well. And in addition, this Global Crisis Response Group is keeping a close watch on about 90 countries that are particularly exposed to this uh, multi-crisis. There are 94 of them, and those countries have an overall population of well over 1.5 billion. And what we've wanted to maintain through this is that this crisis is widespread and is affecting many peoples and, and we need to understand exactly how it is affecting people. What's happening is that the crisis is associated with higher prices of food and of energy and of many other items on which people depend. And that's leading to price inflation. If you're uh, if your white manner of life is such that you perhaps spend around 50% of your income on food, a, a rise in food prices of, say, 30%, as we've seen in some countries in recent months, has a massive impact on the amount of cash that you have to buy the wherewithal you need for life. Quite simply, the value of the money in your pocket is diminishing because of depreciation, and the amount you can buy is diminishing because of higher costs. And this is affecting the, a very large proportion of countries in our world. And the people who are most uh, disturbed as a result of this are poor people who've got limited room for manoeuvre. So they're buying less. And in particular, they're cutting back on things like nutritious food. They're cutting back on what they might call luxury items. They're cutting back on travel. They're cutting back on things that are important for health. So it's a cost of living crisis associated with cutbacks, associated with reduced power of purchase because of depreciation of the income people have, with the overall consequence uh, that actually uh, intake of nutrition and nutritious foods is reduced, uh, and that in turn leads to higher risk of malnutrition, particularly for women and particularly for children. In addition, uh, many of the rural dwellers who are in difficulty are small-scale farmers, and so that means they're going to have difficulty producing food next year. So what's now an access crisis when it comes to food may become an availability crisis uh, in uh, a year's time. And to deal with this, we need responses that both 
respond to immediate needs with social protection, with nutrition, uh, with even humanitarian assistance, but also uh, to ensure that their longer term resilience is improved. So that means trying to equip those who are dependent on on agriculture with the wherewithal, the seeds and the fertilizers they need. But in order for that to be done, uh, households uh, uh, need access to cash and co- governments need access to cash. And with the very limited availability of cash in the current accounts of many governments, there is a big, big issue of, of financial need. And so that's why right now, at this time, it's so important that uh, countries are being uh, helped with better access to, to cash through special drawing rights and through renegotiation of their debt service payments. Uh, and we are asking for this to be continued for some time. So, everybody, thanks for the chance to talk about the Global Crisis Response Group. Uh, and I really do hope that your meeting goes really I want to thank him, I'm sure, on behalf of all of us for what has been a very, while brief, uh, a, a very uh, uh, comprehensive overview delivered with uh, passion. Uh, I, uh, and of course, the three C's, we'll be hearing more about the three C's uh, as we uh, move along. What I was particularly uh, also uh, impressed uh, by uh, David's uh, analysis, uh, I was impressed in, in, in his dynamic uh, uh, assessment of the situation, showing how undesirable developments now are likely to reverberate into more undesirable developments, for example, as it comes to planting and so on, uh, prospects uh, next year and, and potentially uh, beyond that. So. This is a very serious food security crisis that the world is facing at this stage. Um, And CGIR, of course, is responding to that uh, in the form of a food crisis response. Um, And that's what we will be hearing about next. Uh, I also see that we have Bram here who is looking at me rightly because he's he's an important member of that food crisis response. We we have uh, Oscar here uh, who is doing the same thing as the Director General of SIP. Yo is the DG, the Director General of the International Food Policy Research Institute, and at the same time the Managing Director, Systems Transformation, one CGIR. So, Yo, you have the floor on the topic of CG food, food crisis response. I think you have something like seven minutes if the organizers are nodding. So, you may want to come up here. I'll go over there. Thank you very much, Marco, and uh, also thanks to David Nabarro for, uh, as you mentioned already, Marco, for his great leadership, I think. He was really a great leader during the United Nations Food Systems Summit, and and so the year leading up to that summit, and then the months afterwards, and now also in the crisis response group. Uh, Something that David did not mention, I think, was that uh, the CGIR is actually actively involved in this crisis response group. Several people from several centers who are participating in his weekly meetings and uh, contributing analyses in which goes into the conclusions of of the group. Um, I have been trying to squeeze uh, three 15-minute talks into uh, uh, five minutes, but then I got two minutes extra this morning, so I'm uh, I'm in better shape here. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to give you a flavor of a couple of things. And so just to know everybody here in the audience and people online, that there are uh, more elaborate presentations and and documentations and slideshows available for people who are interested in in getting more details on some of these things. I see there's also several of my colleagues in the audience who have been working on this are involved, and so they can come in, I think, with some specific cases, examples, during the Q&A, and of course in the panel, uh, some of these things will be brought up. Um, David has given a very good intro to the issues, but I've put two slides, okay, just to give you a little bit of background. I always think my mind is a bit, the picture tells a thousand words sometimes, and also to link what we do to the crisis. So the point which is really important to understand is that really the turnaround in the food security situation in uh, the world precedes both COVID and the current crisis. It really started in 2015, where we see, and this is on the, oh, sorry. I'm switch. I've switched my own slide, but not yours. So that's, that's too far. Uh, there's a 
a slight missing here. Okay, so we'll do it without these. So essentially, it precedes the two fifth. Uh, it basically precedes the, the the COVID and the current crisis. So in 2015, the 25-year decline in in uh, hunger in the world really stops and turns around and starts growing again. And this is a really fundamental structural change in the food security world, if you want. Then uh, we've had a multitude of crises, and they have essentially complemented each other and, and basically interacted with each other, and David explained that very well. At this point, about one-third of the people who have hunger in the world are, have acute hunger, okay, due to the combination of conflict, of climate, of COVID-19, etc. And so these have um, really made life extremely difficult for people around the world. Um, then if we look, another point which is important for, to understand is if we look over the past 25 years, okay, then you see that this is a very volatile world. So if, when, when the price were spiking in 2008, we talked about the price shock. And shock means that basically you move from a stable normality to something which is unusual, which is unusual, a shock, right? What we see over the past 25 years, it's been one shock after another, okay? And so volatility is the new normal, and that means our whole food systems uh, analysis, our, our policy framework has to take that as the base, okay? And that means that the resilience issue is, should be much more central to our thinking than it was uh, years ago. Uh, the other point is that we're currently in a crisis. The compounding of these different effects makes okay, it much more difficult to deal with it. There's short-run, medium-run, and long-term issues, and we need to deal with that. And that's really what we are trying to do at the CGIR. So we've put together um, a an, an seven-point, uh, basically, action area, a crisis response thing. But what's really important is that there's three key components. One, the crisis is global, so we need a global response, and I think CGIR is really a global institution. It's really fit for purpose there. It really requires a system response because it is really uh, the problems are at different levels. It's not just a reduction in yields, for example. It's much more for broader. Of course, <laughs> the yields remain very important to deal with. And then the short, medium, and long-term things, so we need to deal with that. And so the first point is that our 2030 research and innovation strategy very much remains important in the current world. It really has resilience at the center, it has the global approach, the systems approach at the center, and therefore this is really, in a way, our, our, our most fundamental response is keep doing what we promised that we would be doing over the next 10 years. In addition, these are the seven action points, uh, innovation areas, in addition to that. So that means one of them is, and I'm gonna go fairly briefly through them just to give you a flavor of, of these things, one of them is real-time monitoring and early warning. AIM is, for example, the Agriculture Market Information System, which was introduced after uh, the last crisis, has been helping very much right now to predict the situation. We can do much better than that, and we are really equipped well to do much better than that. Digital innovations, et cetera, can help. Policy advice and analysis, we've done a lot of this. Uh, there's been um, in the rapid reactions that we've seen. Uh, to, Various of the centers, I mean, Brahm and his team at CIMIT have published a lot of uh, several op-ed pieces. We've done a lot of analysis at IFPRI and with colleagues from the different centers, and we can do more. Um, the third one is uh, food and nutrition security in fragile system. There we do again, you know, you don't take the stability as the norm, you take fragility as a, as a stand situation, and you rethink, okay, how can you deal with um, basically addressing food and nutrition security, but also land and water systems in this more fragile uh, world. Seed systems is, of course, central to what the CGIR does, and there also I think we can do better in the short run, more targeted to crisis response in terms of faster dissemination, but also linking the demand, which is there in crisis situation, more directly to our breeding systems and the whole value chain in between. Clearly, uh, management, crisis responsive management, and I'm thinking uh, particularly on, on livestock management as well, aquatic food systems, just in addition to, to the crop management. Uh, the sixth point is, is, I think, is a really important one. I mean, the whole issue of fertilizers has come really to the forefront in these problems. I mean, David Nabarro just mentioned this. There, I think we can do um, much better, I mean, much better in the sense, much better sounds, we're not doing the right thing right now, but I think we can make a major contribution by both working on the technical work, on things like agroecology, okay, how can we address uh, 
soil fertility without relying on the traditional fertilizer that we're using, but also the analysis of the fertilizer markets, fertilizer policies. There's a huge amount of fertilizer subsidies being given in the world. How can we make them uh, more effective, also more efficient use of fertilizer, etc. A lot of things where CGR is, can really play an important role. And talking about win-win situation, this is clearly an area where there's room for win-win situation. And then a stronger link even more than our, our strategy, it's already there, stronger work with the national agricultural um, research and innovation systems. The last slides have, and we have a series of these on a number of win-win uh, policies uh, or, or areas that we can work on. I am I don't have time going through all of these, but for example, in the area of gender, I think there's a lot of great work that we can do, seed system, livestock management, et cetera, where we actually can make achievements in different areas, on the environment, on farm incomes, on uh, gender equality, social inclusion, et cetera, nutrition, obviously. Let me just end with this particular slide, give one example of this win-win area. This is an area where uh, we have been closely involved in together with the World Bank and FEO on rethinking the food finance agriculture ar architecture, if you want. Okay? And so we're thinking about different way of accessing finance for the investments for the future. Some of it is going through new ways of sourcing uh, investment from capital markets, for example. This is about, well, there is already $700 billion a year spent in the world on agricultural subsidies. And we know that some of these subsidies are just very ineffective. They don't have much impact on farm incomes. They distort markets. They stimulate production systems which are agricultural, are environmentally unsustainable. So can't we do this better? And this is really what this exercise does. And so if we repurpose uh, some of this support, and so just removing it is not having much of an impact. That's what the first panel shows, surprisingly, also for us when we first did it. And then, but repurposing it, targeting it better to R&D, et cetera, really has a big impact on multiple areas, okay? On social effects, diets, so nutrition, climate change, nature, et cetera, and economic effects. And so this is really a systems approach. This is way beyond that our modelers were working before. They were just looking at trade distortions, market distortions. Now we're bringing in these diet these uh, effects, environmental effects, et cetera. So I think it's a very exciting area of work and uh, just as an illustration of some of the win-win issues. So let me leave it at that and happy to add, answer any questions you may have in the Q&A. Marco, back to you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Jo, uh, for this overview of CGIR's response to the global food crisis. You have ex <clears throat> explained the systems thinking underpinning it, which leads to the concept of multiple win solutions, which are logically inevitable if you pursue, as we do, that which the literature has termed hers outcomes, healthy, equitable, resilient, sustainable. You've given us uh, an overview of the seven innovation areas here and uh, given some concrete examples of win-win uh, solutions. Uh, thank you very much. Let's now uh, move immediately into our moderated panel discussion. We have about 45 minutes for that discussion before the audience is invited to come in. We have four distinguished panelists. Uh, I'm listing them in, 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 in no particular order except the order in which my uh, script here uh, indicates them starting with Jan Lowe, 2016 World Food Prize co-laureate and principal scientist at SIP. Uh, Mahalingam Gov Govindaraj, 2022 Borlaug Field Award recipient, congratulations Govind, and senior scientist for Crop Development Harvest Plus, and also at the Alliance of Bio, uh, Diversity, Biodiversity and, uh, and, and SIAD. And, and uh, Govind will be speaking to us uh, on live video link from his room, he could not be here with us right now. Then we go to Dina Esposito. I think actually, Dina, you'll be the first speaker. Uh, bear with me one more, one more minute. Uh, Dina is at USAID, the Global Food Crisis Coordinator and Bureau for Resilience and Food Security Lead. And our fourth panelist is uh, Jo, who requires no further introduction. Now, uh, we will go through two rounds of questions for each panelist. You will be invited to stick to about two minutes for each of your answers, if that is possible. The first round will be devoted more to the question of innovation, second round more to the question of scaling. And so, Dina, as the, world's, as the world heads into multiple challenges, 
how can CGIAR and other agricultural organizations effectively respond to the food crisis? Is this a question that you expected? I hope it is, because that is what I'm told is your question. It's, it's close have, enough. It's we close have enough. Govind uh, yeah. online. Good morning, uh, Govind. Uh, but uh, the floor is yours, Tina. Yeah. Thank you very much for, for the question and for inviting me to this panel. Um, it was great to hear the overview from David Navarro and um, likewise, Yo and IFPRI. It's been an, for such an important partner as the United States tries to figure out how to lead in response to the global food crisis. The first thing I would say is a resounding yes to the IFPRI innovation areas that were, that were laid out, the CG innovation areas, and it very much aligns with our new global food security strategy which is taking a systems approach. It's uh, elevating uh, the work of not just our agricultural work, but food security, water security, uh, looking at nutrition security, all, all alongside climate adaptation and mitigation approaches, looking at conflict sensitivity in some of these really fragile places where we work, and all underlined by these, uh, this through line of resilience, the shocks being a new normal as well as inequity. We heard David talk about rising inequity and the importance of our strategy being much more directive on that score. But I am pleased that the United States government has been able, thanks to the generosity of the American people, receive additional funding over and above our normal work for food security, um, some $5 billion in humanitarian aid just since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, as well as almost a billion dollars in development resources. So I think one message is to sort of keep sounding the bell that the response to the global food crisis cannot simply be on the humanitarian side. And it is extraordinary that we were able to receive these resources. And I think uh, it's not over. We're going to have to continue to sustain these investments. So I think that's a key, a key message for all of us. Um, with regard to how we've spent that money, we relied very heavily on some of the research of the CGs, uh, particularly in understanding how food, fuel, and fertilizer prices are affecting our programming in the 19 priority countries where we're doing food security work, and then looking at your modeling in terms of the impact of different policy prescriptions. And once we understood sort of where we might get the biggest bang for our bucks, we developed um, an, an agenda, a, a strategy around how to prioritize those new resources. And that involves a focus on improving the access, availability, and utilization of fertilizer. You talked about that as being a top priority in terms of a game-changing solution, a win-win solution in the midst of a climate crisis to really look at that much more deeply. And that's an area of, of investment and one where the CG centers have been helpful. The second is accelerating last mile delivery of tools, technologies, and, pr and production methods um, to those smallholder farmers who are the worst affected. And then just the power of social protection, mitigating the worst impacts of the crisis on the most vulnerable has been proven. We've seen it in our own nations with regard to COVID and, and the US strongly supporting and advocating for that agenda and funding it as well. So definitely sustained access to this real-time information to understand the impact of these shocks which come ever faster, but also understanding projected impacts, those future impacts, getting ahead of things, early warning. We're not great at early response, but we need the early warning and we need the recommendations around early action, I think, as policymakers. Um, finally, I would just highlight that um, that system approach means we need to figure out how to get all of those extraordinary innovations, and I'm not going to compete with the seed scientists and the experts on the amazing uh, innovations which you're going to hear more about, but just to say that we need a big tent, right? We need um, innovation and uh, technology is necessary but not sufficient. So we have asked the CG centers right now in response to the global crisis to convene with what USAID calls its last mile partners, the small and medium enterprises and national um, governments, sub-regional and local partners to really accelerate the access to innovation and proven methods um, of those smallholder farmers worst affected. And there is like a co-creation process ongoing right now in Zambia, um, where we hope that uh, the focus will be on equitable access to these proven technologies and approaches for women and youth, diversification of the production system, taking advantage of a crisis to create opportunity by bringing together not just those who look at seeds, but also livestock, horticulture, aquaculture, and uh, those involved in credit and finance. So taking a very systemic approach and using, again, the crisis to sort of accelerate what's an ongoing process. Certainly we understand these dimensions, but can we use this moment to really jumpstart 
in a different way and with a new sense of urgency that dissemination of technology and systems uh, and, and, and practice. So we hope to reach about 3 million farmers over the next 6 to 12 months just in southern Africa with this additional resources and then moving into other, other parts of the region and doing similar co-creation process grounded in context, taking the global research and technology that you have but bringing it down to the local level in a way that's maybe a little bit more urgent, less incremental than maybe we're used to given the nature of the crisis and the speed with which we have to move. Thank you very much, Dina, and let me just uh, seize the opportunity to thank you and USAID for the excellent relationship that we have together, USAID and CGIR, and of course for the in immeasurably important funding that comes from through your organization the, to enable international agricultural research under this broad tent uh, 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 approach uh, that, that systems thinking and systems trans that the systems transformation uh, ambition requires. Next, Govind, please, our Borlaug Field awardee of this year. Congratulations again. This is for your seminal work on biofortification, in particular in relation to pearl millet in India and Africa. And my question to you, Govind, is how do you see biofortification as a tool to promote nutrition during <coughs> times of crisis? And what other technologies and approaches are required to more effectively respond to food crises? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for. A nice introduction, Marco. So I'm unable to join in physically, but I'm happy to give my perspective uh, through the virtual participation. As you said, the food crisis is everywhere, is impacted huge and heavily. And this is, is a, a critical time. The CGR can play a key role, and it has been played a couple of years, and we have evidence for that. So CGR is enabled the scientists to develop multiple crops with the multiple traits, variety of traits that come adaptation of stress tolerance, climate, and including nutrition today. Therefore, biofortification, one of the best example today that can quickly react during the pandemics. So I would give some few examples in Africa and as well as in Asia. So we reached huge uh, farmers and consumers during the pandemics through the research delivery aspect, as well as the, the humanitarian uh, extended hand helps. So therefore, this is an opportunity for us to help uh, the national system, as well as the, uh, the private sector. So what I would say is that the, using this platform, CGR has a variety of crops and variety of trades and variety of experts, crop expert, nutrition expert, socioeconomist. I think therefore, that no other organization in the world has this expertise to react to any of the natural calamities, including the pandemics. So therefore, <clears throat> the perfect uh, uh, match, the panelist and perfect, perfect research group we have, therefore, we are able to reach about 12 billion people so far beneficiating uh, the, using the biofortified crops. The promotion of the biofortified crop is very much important in terms of you know creating awareness and creating the market and and also looking at the climate change aspect and which is which is uh, widespread across the developing country especially the dryland agriculture system so this is very important important to create the nutritional value on top of the yield on top of the climate change factor so therefore so we have the multiple technology in hands which needed the further scaling up. So therefore, I, I see that other technology come all together, climate change, biofortification, and also the seed system. Everything is, is need to be aligned and standardized. We have the uh, publicly available standards in the Harvest Plus uh, and targeted nutrition traits, iron, zinc, and pro-vitamin A, which is very well systematically developed that can help both the breeding as well as the market-oriented product uh, procurement. So therefore, I feel that health interventions in the future should include and explore the, the opportunity of uh, getting benefit from the biofortified crops is really going to help a large number of farmers and consumers. Therefore, the mainstreaming of the biofortification uh, for these three trades where we have very well demonstrated all the standards and gemplasm and the scaling up strategy is need to be implemented in the CG as well as the NOTS uh, breeding program. So therefore, I feel that the going forward, the accelerated action 
of uh, every uh, multidisciplinary uh, aspect. So we need to join hands, climate change and nutrition as the two uh, uh, side of the coin. So we need to improve both uh, stress resilience as well as the nutrition stability to benefit the more farmer and consumer. So therefore, I'd like to thank the organizer for uh, giving me the opportunity. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Govind. 12 million people so far is beginning to look like scale. So you can be, and we can be collectively very proud of, of that. And of course, biofortification, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this from Jan uh, just now, is by now an established intervention that has its role uh, in terms of uh, of filling uh, micronutrient gaps. Of course, the ultimate goal is uh, healthy, diversified diets, but as we have heard also in the presentation from David, that is unfortunately not within reach in the short run for many people, for too many people. Jan, the floor is yours. You're a co-laureate, as we know, with Maria Andrade, Robert Mwanga, and Howdy Pui of the 2016 World Food Prize. And my question to you is, of course, has to do with orange flesh, fleshed sweet potato and the question of how CGIR and other agricultural organizations uh, can effectively respond to the food prop, uh, crisis and the role of biofortification there. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you all today. And I want to particularly thank you know, all the support we've gotten from the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance, uh, the former OFDA, in being able to help these communities. And right now we at the International Potato Center in Disaster Response Initiatives in Ethiopia and Madagascar with your support and, and also in Mozambique. And I think I look at it as a disaster response with proper planning can be a development opportunity and we have to take it as such. Um, we do one-shot nutrition campaigns associated with getting the planting material out to the farmers and setting up decentralized networks of multiplication to ensure that. We're always struggling in our research programs where how do we go to scale? Well, actually, guess what? Disaster opportunities, you are scaling. Mm -hmm. So for example, in Madagascar, we've been developing a whole digital tool system for registering beneficiaries, giving them uh, lanyards with barcodes so we can follow up and get gender desegregated data on who's receiving this planting material, and then we can go back and locate these households for further training uh, that we're doing with community agents in a training of training systems. So again, these are exposure trainings, and the ideal is that raises the awareness, and then hopefully that develops into further resilience opportunities to build you know, sort of the integrated agriculture, more in-depth nutrition and marketing opportunities to really make uh, these adoptions, permanent adoptions. But there's a couple caveats we have to put in that I think is very important. And for us to be able to respond, we have to have the varieties that are adapted to those particular locations released and in the system. And breeding takes time. Now we've been fortunate in Madagascar um, and we've been fortunate in Ethiopia because that varietal and Mozambique, of course, with Maria, that those drought tolerant varieties have been available to draw on and use in these programs. Which means we need as breeders to be targeting these most vulnerable areas ahead of time so these materials can be ready to go to scale. We have a particular challenge with vegetatively propagated crops because they take longer time to multiply than grain crops. So this is true for cassava, this is true for all of our vegetatively propagated crops. So the emergency response typically from BHA takes a, you know, not 12 months, but 18 months and sometimes 24 months to have that effective response. Because we want quality planting material going out. And getting those quality standards in place and maintaining those actually requires quite a bit of supervision. I think we all know the stories of junk being dumped in emergency response and we don't want to be associated with that. And so we have to take particular care in emergency response to be getting quality seed out. So planning our breeding programs ahead of time to make sure our site selection is aligned with areas that are the most vulnerable. And then ideally having initial seed system research 
in that area to understand how local seed systems are functioning and who the players are so as much as possible we can use those existing seed systems. One of the real dangers we have in emergency response, and we've fought this for years in Mozambique, and you know, there's always a disaster somewhere. So we, at times, particularly, I think with free grain distribution, we might be undermining existing commercial seed systems. It's a real <coughs> conflict between, because when you're in emergency response, you know, you have to have some way of getting that seed out quickly. People are hungry. So you, there tends to be a free distribution. With our vegetatively propagated crops, we tend to do a payback system. You're going to get it for free, and you're going to pass it on to two others in the next season. With the grain crops, it's an issue, and, and, and because there could be seed companies out there. So again, this requires upfront work to identify those partners. How can we work with those partners effectively upfront? But I think really, in my mind, it's the preparatory work, making sure we have the right materials to go. And then, of course, we're getting a lot of orange flesh varieties out there now. People are really loving them. And we have to be evaluating their performance as they go into many diverse areas because we are scaling in these disaster response opportunities. Thank you very much, Jan. The eloquent elaboration on Dina's point with respect to the importance of the last mile. The last mile can only be successful if we've got uh, relevant products. And in order to have relevant products, we need to plan breeding strategies ahead of time. Exactly. Yo, food systems. Tell us a little bit more from a professorial perspective. What, is, what are food systems and how, how do we need to think <laughs> about them? Because systems can be... Okay, so we understand immediately, but when we begin to think about it in terms of food, land, and water systems, it gets complicated pretty fast. <laughs> exactly. So it's a question you can answer very quickly and very long, so it's, I kind of have to do something in between, I guess. So it's, a, you know, when I first started thinking about it, before you, before you know you end up with something, everything depends on everything, right? And as a, a scientist, you just want to get away from that because you want to identify why is something depending more on it than something else. And so, uh, so you have a getting out of the spaghetti ball kind of thinking because it also muddles your thinking and it doesn't really lead to, to useful uh, conclusions. So one way of thinking about it, very simply, is to think about it as a horizontal and a vertical dimension. And there's more dimension to that, but just to keep it in two minutes here, right? So the horizontal is really about Traditionally, the CGIR is very much focused on uh, producing uh, on productivity gains, right? To put it very simple. And uh, increasing the availability of food has been hugely successful in a number of these areas. I think the Green Revolution and, and other things, the biofortification case, where the nutrition link is already brought in more. But then I think moving into things like spending more, uh, paying more attention to quality, to nutrition, diets, environmental effects, uh, the link with climate change, biodiversity, and not forgetting coming back to poverty issue. I mean, the Eat Lancet report, for example, came up with a great diet, but then three billion people on the planet cannot afford it. And so uh, look, luckily Shakuntala is here. She's the co-lead of Eat Lancet 2.0, so she's going to solve all these problems now in the new report. But I think that's the horizontal dimension, bringing these different uh, aspects in, in our way of thinking, but also in our work and targeting these objectives. The vertical one is, it's crucial to keep working on farms and with farms and increasing uh, productivity, etc. But at the same time, I mean, also think about from the consumer perspective, I mean, our traditional development economics model, we're all supply, much was very much supply driven as the CGIR was initially. And right now, much of the thinking is demand driven. You start from the consumer and you work back from there because that's where the demand is, where your products have to go to. And uh, <clears throat> so that's one step, but it's not enough, right? Between the consumer and the farmer, there's a lot going on there. It's what, it's the market, but I would r normally refer to it as institutions of exchange, okay? A farmer doesn't sell his apples like in the apple, like in the farmer's market directly to the consumer. He sells it to a supermarket or a big trade or whatever. So you have to integrate these things in your analysis. And there's been what we have referred to as a revolution that's been gone and value chains in developing countries over the past 20 years. And we really need to bring that very explicitly in our thinking about it to be relevant, I think, going forward. Let me leave it at that. Right. All right. Well, okay. Thank you very much. So let's go into a different into a next round. And, and unfortunately, of course, I've just been told that we are needing to watch our time. So, Dina, has the world... No. My questions are on the... The next page. 
I think, Dina, you, you'll not be the first speaker. The first speaker, the first next speaker is Jan. Partnerships, Jan. Partnerships, and I don't need to say more, right? Crucial for all, all stages of CGIAR. Can you elaborate? I'm sorry. Partnerships. Partnerships. Yes. And, and, and their role in scaling. Oh, clearly partnerships are extremely, I think that goes without saying. I think everybody in the room knows partnerships are key to everything. But I think one of the challenges we face there is really different levels of partnerships. There are obviously partnerships where we have agreements and we have take the time to set what are our common goals, what are our common visions, what are our common implementation systems that we're going to use and monitoring tools. Um, you know, our very close research partners, uh, national systems, other things that we're doing at that level. In emergency response, when you're going to scale, I would say you tend to work more in coalitions. And one of the challenges that you have in that kind of thing is that you're different partners. Um, you can try and have great agreement, but you're under time pressure and you're under stress. And I think one of the hardest things to have to face and realize is they're gonna take parts of your package and not all of your package. And, and so you have to come up with what is the um, least intensive monitoring system that you can put into place with those partners and get agreement on. It's a different negotiation because if you're gonna reach that scale, um, that's a challenge. So one of the things we've really invested in is a lot of uh, development of training materials that people can access and utilize and uh, you know, try and, and use in their own organizations and adapt and provide those training opportunities for short-term trainings. Um, and it's not a perfect world that we live in and therefore we really try as much as possible when we're doing one of these response efforts to have our own staff on the ground to backstop and help with those trainings and reinforce those systems. But, you know, it's, it's a very different kettle of fish when you're in an emergency response. Um, and I think we have to uh, realize that um, it won't necessarily be um, the kind of scaling effort you would have if you had a longer period of time and all the partners on board are, are really in a, a common unified um, front. So I think that's the two cents I have to put on partnerships. Social marketing work that you engaged in. Social marketing. I disagree a little bit with uh, Yo uh, in some mm. respects because I always say nobody wakes up in the morning saying I feel vitamin A deficient. And, and so people don't realize hidden hunger. And so I, I'm a strong believer in demand creation campaigns. Um, it's not always just market driven. If, you know, we've had market driven in the food system for a long time and we're eating too much fat and sugar. That's market driven, that's what people like to eat and they sell it very well. So I think it really requires an investment in uh, nutrition education at all levels, which we try and incorporate into emergency response programs. It's an opportunity to reach people and we can do that. But I, um, I know economists and I'm an economist too, but I've, you know, I'm also a person that cares about changing the food system and I think a lot of those subsidies we're really directing have to go into demand creation campaigns for nutritious foods. So we'll keep discussing this. All right, keep up the creative, <laughs> keep, keep up the creative tension. That's what research and, and, and innovation is all about. Actually, CGIR is all about, Dina, CGIR is all about creative tension and some of it we play out with you, with you and your, your team at uh, the USAID. Govind, the private sector, scaling. What's the role of the private sector in scaling both Biofortified crops, and can you maybe make some, give us some more general insights for CGIR more broadly? Govind, did you hear my question? Can you hear us, Govind? Maybe while Connectivity gets re-established. I'll go to. Ah, he lost his voice. Let's go to Dina for uh, an intervention, and we'll come back to him. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> it is his. Um, if you can speak, Govind, uh, the role yeah. of the private sector in scaling, please go ahead. 
Yeah, thank you. And okay. somehow I missed this uh, voice from your oversight. <clears throat> thank you so much. Yeah, CGR has been doing many excellent work in more than five decades. And private sector is, is participating and taking innovations and scaling up. However, I see that we need to react and collaborate uh, more aggressively in an accelerated manner. So therefore, I see that private sector model is more will be sustainable to reach the several billions because CGAR and NARS cannot reach everywhere. But they are the successor model and we cannot depend on the donor funding to reach the millions every time. So therefore, I see the private sector role is key, especially we, rely, we realized in biofortification dissemination. And say, for example, Pakistan zinc wheat is highly, you know, is one of the best uh, model and reached the seed market more than 20%. So this is a huge uh, accomplishment by the North people as well as the proactive seed producer. So I feel that the, the uh, private sector involvement, uh, especially on the research as well as the delivery is a very key role uh, will be playing and a CGR can catalyze that and improve that uh, uh, model to explore other uh, innovations coming out of the CGR as well as the NAR system. The food system approach also is yet to be explored where the food industry can uptake the most of the research innovation come out of, come out of the CGR as well as the NAR system. So the food, food industry increased uptake and therefore the product making and processing is likely to improve and increase and therefore the production of the a particular product and innovation can be scaled up. So the hybrid crop as John mentioned that the vegetatively propagated crops there is less player from the private sector because the profit oriented and therefore uh, we would see that hybrid crops is, is a major uh, uh, profit oriented uh, private sector investment. And we see that that is one of the opportunities CGR can leverage and take the innovation to the, the commercial mode. So biofortification, and as I mentioned that mainstreaming, so so far biofortified crops released uh, largely and almost, in, almost entirely by the public system. So if the private sector investment and involvement is, is, uh, is available and extended, and this type of product will enhance its competitiveness commercially and also to reach the million more farmers and consumers. So therefore, I see uh, CGR can play a key role and catalyze the more than ever in encouraging the private sector, the scaling up the CGR and large system innovation coming from the uh, uh, nutrition research, socioeconomic research, and as well as the product oriented. So therefore, all the product-oriented research innovations need the private sector involvement and investment in coming years. Therefore, we can see the many farmers and consumers will be benefiting out of it. And thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Govind. Clearly, the private sector is crucially important as a scaling partner for CGIR innovations, for, for innovations of the public sector, innovations developed by national agricultural research uh, programs in the countries in which we work. One of the questions that arises is the interface between breeding, which is typically in the public sector for the kinds of markets that we are talking about, and the private sector through that can, can come in through seed systems for uh, scaling purposes. And I think that is what Jan uh, referred to uh, earlier on. That interface sometimes doesn't work very smoothly, and it is a it's it's a it's a topic that uh, I know uh, you 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 encountered in the context of marketing uh, orange fleshed uh, sweet potatoes. We're encountering it in the context of uh, of uh, taking to market uh, seed uh, products. Uh, improved varieties by CGIR uh, all of the time. Dina, this also refers to my question to you, which is about scaling. What, what are best practices and what are some of the challenges that we face as we scale innovations? We have to assume the innovations are relevant in the eyes of users first, right? And then take it from there, scaling from there. Thanks. Um, we talk about challenges a lot. I thought that it would be good to start with some successes. Uh, Feed the Future, which is the U.S. government global hunger initiative, has been around 
since 2010, authorized by Congress in 2014, and continues to be reauthorized with very strong bipartisan support. And we're releasing a progress report today, actually, on some of the recent successes. And um, I think it is great just to remember, I mean, we've started to hear some examples of scaling uh, with Govind and, and um, the other panelists. And, um, but drought resistant, drought tolerant maize in southern and eastern Africa, 17 million hectares, 4 million farmers boosting yields by as much as 40%, even in the 20, you know, 16 El Nino drought, which is one of the worst droughts on record. Examples of the orange flesh sweet potato reaching one in eight Ugandans, five and a half million now growing and eating this vitamin A rich nutritious food. And the CTIAR varieties of cassava now being used by 66% of cassava growers in Nigeria, associated with an 82% increase in yield. So we need to hold those in our minds and sort of pull forward the lessons um, when we think about kind of the dark days that it feels like we're in. So I think it's important to start with a positive. Um, in terms of lessons, I think we need to put on our business hats more and treat agriculture as a business, not just a social sector. I would love to ban the term beneficiary from every document and conversation and really think of smallholder farmers as viable economic partners who are incentivized by all the things that we're, we're incentivized by. Um, so that's one. Another is uh, learn from the private sector in terms of being um, sort of ruthless in our product, product life cycle, creating scaling criteria and stage gates for go, no-go decisions. We're not great at that in government, but we're, we're working on it in terms of adopting new approaches to the way we judge our research investments and getting um, more work to do around adapting and flexibility within our programming and budgeting to pivot in order to take advantage when we learn lessons and need to change, change approaches. Um, the plan to scale for up, planning for scale up front is another, I think, critical thing. What is going to be the pathway to scale? We have to decide that right at the beginning, not sometime after we have a product in hand. And is it a public partner, private partnership? Is it strictly commercialization? What does it look like? Um, remember, it's not just technology. Jan was very eloquent on this point, but we may need to scale new behaviors. And sometimes we're not, you know, we don't have those two things totally lined up. It's not just about partnerships, but it's about trust. It's this kind of intangible thing that we're asking people to work together who haven't worked together or to buy products or engage in loans and financing between groups that just don't trust each other. So how do we tra tackle that? And then finally, um, be very intentional about inclusive scaling or it doesn't happen. So you can't design for women. You have to design with women. You can't design for youth. You have to design with youth. Um, otherwise, it just the scaling doesn't uh, it doesn't reach the the equity issue that we're very very interested in. Uh, I, I think that is uh, very very uh, good advice. Um, also, uh, your point about scaling requiring a plan. Of course, it has to be an adaptive plan because things will change, and it has to be an inclusive plan at the same time. I think those are very important points. Um, yo, back to systems. Horizontal, vertical, the question of bundling. Yeah, I think to, to some extent uh, the previous speakers on the, on the panel have already addressed some of these things. I think everybody agrees, at least the way I understood it, that the, I mean, technology alone is not going to solve the world or the problems, right? It is, let me just make sure, it is very important, but I think it has to be part of a package of innovation, of technological innovation, institutional innovations, and then policy innovations. And the reason is actually not so difficult. We have a lot of technologies right now available, but they're just not used, okay? And we are working on new technology. I think rice, livestock management for greenhouse gas emissions is a huge thing going forward. But again, people have to use it. And so what if farmers are not using the technologies that we've developed? What if, if consumers do not use the, the, uh, or choose unhealthy foods uh, over uh, healthy alternatives, etc.? Uh, even if they are available, the, the healthy options. And there's, there's, an, there's actually, if you can, you can summarize in three groups of constraints. If you, one is they may not know about it, okay, so information is important. Second, they may know about it, but they, can't, they, they cannot use it for a number of constraints. And the third one is they can use it, but they choose not to do it because they, the incentives are wrong. And so that's really, I think, where the institutional and the policy innovations have to come in, reduce the constraints, may, make sure farmers have access to, to finance, to invest in some of these technologies if needed to enhance their, their uh, human capital, their, their basically their skills if these are needed, 
uh, on the consumer side as well, if, farmers, if uh, consumers cannot afford a healthy diet, we have to work on it, either lower the cost of it or, or increase the incomes there somehow. And the incentives are, are clearly, some clearly biased, and that could be due to a number of constraints. But one is sometimes policies which basically induce for people to, to choose the wrong things, in, uh, from, uh, wrong from, from basically the, the way we want to go, the targets that we have set. And so the repurposing uh, agenda really fits in there, but there's a whole bunch of things that fit in there, which have been mentioned, I think, by my colleagues as well. Let me leave it at that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yo. Colleagues, we have time to hear from you. We've got experts on all of these questions right here in the audience. Who would like to speak, challenge the panel? Please. A little louder. Yeah. Um, uh, Ellen. Okay, my name is Ellen Levinson. Um, I, I have a, a question because of, of what you were talking about, particularly Dina and Jan. I, I, I'm real happy to hear what's going on, you know, and. And what's really, you know, the way that you're working together in disasters now to do much more, right, and take it to the next level. My question is, and particularly what we're talking about, uptake of technologies and practices, socioeconomic changes, equity, all those, you know, all those factors. How can you use these disasters, it's a terrible thing to say, as we know, but we have to say it, to, to move into the development phase and to keep those partnerships and keep the real time adaptation going forward, how can that partnership go on? I mean, there's so much truncation and siloing in government and the way that, you know, you have like the CGs and then you have the community groups and then you have the, you know, the private sector and it's hard to keep that together. I'm just wondering what kind of work is going on to bring that together in a cohesive way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me take one more question and then we'll turn it to the panel. Elsa, would you like to come in? Elsa Murano, board chair of Ilri, we haven't spoken about, right there, we haven't spoken about livestock yet. That's right, thank you very much. Uh, Elsa Murano, um, chair of the board of trustees of Ilri, uh, so very familiar with the CGIAR, uh, incredible scientists uh, that, that we have all throughout the system. My question is um, for the panelists regarding uh, the CGIAR system, of course, tremendous resource of uh, many centers for incredible um, abilities and uh, history. As we can see, for example, we've got a, a laureate who is a scientist at one of our centers. But my question regarding livestock, and I'm sorry to maybe be a little uh, too focused on that, but um, it's, a, it's a not, not only a great source of nutrition uh, for people around the world, but also um, it is a source of income, let's, let's face it. But there's a lot of uh, issues regarding livestock. Uh, on the negative side, it's seen by some people as maybe the, the cause of the problems by others is, can be the solution. Um, so how can, in your opinion, what would you suggest would be the right way to combine livestock systems and crop systems in such a way that they are mutually beneficial and uh, can jointly solve or at least help mitigate issues such as climate change. Very clear and not entirely easy. Panelists, uh, in uh, which, whichever way you want to choose. Uh, Dina, do you want to go first? Yeah. Yes, please. I can, uh, I'll start with um, Ellen's question, which is, a, which is a great one. And I just love Jan's visual of using disasters as an opportunity to scale development solutions, and uh, I haven't really quite thought of it that way, although I spend a lot of time thinking about these things, so thank you for that. 25% um, of the resources that um, the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security receives from Congress goes towards food security agendas in fragile places to build resilience of communities facing chronic poverty and recurrent crisis. So that commitment to move some of those development dollars into those more fragile places is trying to shift the mindset in the way that Jan describes. And I was in Nigeria not too long ago looking at programs funded by USAID and the Gates Foundation just as an example of how those things come together, introducing a breed of poultry that is um, easier to keep alive, uh, much more mobile for displaced women who were able to move with livestock and also when in their displaced communities, sell eggs um, and, and meat and earn an income, improve the nutrition of their kids, all in a market systems approach. 
and incomes go up. So this idea of introducing uh, market-based solutions into conflict or fragile places, I've seen it working in places, maybe not at the scale we need, but there's certainly potential there. So um, I think also, you know, seeing um, livestock um, uh, herders using locally produced and selling locally produced feed that's highly nutritious, that reduces their need to um, move into people's farmlands and reduce conflict at the same time as you're growing more food and growing your income is really kind of a win-win extraordinary um, situation that you see again, bright spots in many places. Mm -hmm. But it's still more the exception than the rule. Yeah. Thank you. Other speakers? Yeah, just to, um, I, I, again, uh, it's how you manage it, and I must, uh, my fellow co-laureate Maria Andrade, who's been in Mozambique over t 25 years, is here with us, and um, we actually got Orange Flesh Sweet Potatoes started in Mozambique through a disaster opportunity, and the USAID officials who had turned us down initially, we got the support from Oxfam to do the disaster response, were so impressed they gave us a development project after that for three years because they realize, oh, okay, the, this really is making a difference to nutrition. So in part, it's using the visibility and, and if there is positive impact from your intervention in the disaster response, you need to communicate and get people out to see the work in the field and see what that potential crop can do. So I think that that is an example. And I'm very excited because the, um, in addition to USAID having follow-up funds, looking at longer resilience. I think major donors are aware of that. Um, in Madagascar, for instance, right now, we're in negotiations with the World Bank. Uh, has targeted uh, the area we're working in, southern Madagascar, which is really a site of uh, recurrent drought on one, in the southern part, and on the eastern part, recurrent floods. You know, how do they build long-term resilience? And they, they, they've put in, they are making a 10-year commitment in two phases, and they're negotiating with the, us and other CG centers about, you know, let's solve the longer-term problem. How do we build really more resilient seed systems within the South, and how do we start putting the infrastructure in? Because, you know, these, otherwise, this is just going to keep recurring, keep recurring in these areas that really are at the, really, you know, they're getting hit by climate change harder than many, many other areas in the world. So I, I, I see that as very positive. Livestock, I think we have a lot of research to do. I mean, clearly, if we're moving towards more uh, different ways of doing soil fertility improvement in sub-Saharan Africa, other areas of the world, you know, Animal manure is a key part of that, but the labor issues involved in utilizing that, we have to get more creative because that burden makes it not as effective as it potentially could be. And the, you know, there's all sorts of issues, I think, that are research questions to make those systems more effective. But clearly, people want to use and retain livestock. And of course, from a nutritional perspective, they are the source of B12 and a great source of iron and zinc. So we recognize that and utilize that. Uh, and I think the integration of crop livestock systems is an important way to move forward. And how do you get the balance right is also something we need to work on. I don't think there are any really easy solutions out there because of the competition for land and water. But of course, I have to mention that sweet potato is an excellent cattle and, <laughs> and goat and pig feed. So. You know, I, again, from my perspective, that integration, yeah, the crops and livestock often can move together very effectively, but I don't think we have a lot of scalable solutions out there because of the labor issue. And, you know, we don't want to be pulling kids out of school taking care of livestock, so we've got some real, we, we've got some real challenges mm. on that integration. Mm. Thank you so much, Jan. Uh, Govind, would you like to come in? Can you hear us? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, and the partnership question, I think, is that's a very important uh, to keep uh, the partnership going forward. It's very important to keep in mind that while engaging with the uh, wider partnership, I think we need to understand the, uh, the position of every partners. 
So somebody's need R and D, somebody needs scale, scaling up, and we are engaging from small, medium, and large uh, partners, enterprises. So therefore, we need to keep some of the small and emerging uh, companies. Say, for example, seed company or livestock company, they don't have much facility for the R and D, and say for screening the uh, drought tolerant or maybe some genomic facility for crops. Similarly, for livestock uh, uh, facilities. So therefore, CGR can play extending the facility, you know, to accommodate themselves to find a model how we can, you know, make the a sustainable business model. Not always we can get the private sector facilities, and also we can give the, some of the facility to the small and medium enterprises to come up, you know, to encourage them to scale up further. So that's my point to all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Govind. Um, we have four minutes left. I uh, could ask you to speak if I'm um, seeing that you're taking notes for your next intervention. Do you want to come in? Uh, and there is, if somebody wants to make a, a statement from the audience, not a question because we won't have time to answer it, but a statement or a question that's, that will go unanswered, you're welcome to do that. You first. Uh, yeah, you first and then one person from the audience. Okay, just uh, a quick, I mean, my, I'm not a specialist in this, but it seems to be we need to take a, a very differentiated approach to answer that question. I mean, if you look, livestock is a, is a big issue, for example, in Western Europe right now, but for very different reasons. I mean, in Holland, they, the, the, the government had to step down because of the, the livestock problem. They had tried to cut down basically the, the big uh, uh, farmers because of the long environmental pressure, then the issues on the diet issues are very different in, in the Western world, I think, compared to developing country world. The issue of animal welfare is really central there and things. So I think it's, it's very differentiated. I've done quite a bit of work actually on dairy sector in India, and uh, according to our estimates, it's the biggest agricultural sector in the world, the 70 million dairy farmers in India. And, uh, and of course, the issues they face are very different. Access to feed is one of their uh, biggest problem they face there, so the interaction there is clear. Let me just leave it right. at that. Thank you very much, indeed. Uh, who wanted to, please. Is this working? Okay, great. Um, my name is Julie Ide, I'm with Catholic Relief Services, and I would have loved to actually ask this as a question, but just to, to kind of um, poke this into uh, the conversation that has been there. We've talked about the systems around food security, and in your seven points of innovation, you mentioned soil fertility, and then it, along the lines of moving from humanitarian responses to development, I, I just want to draw out the importance of soil fertility from the perspective of land management, and um, both the adaptation and the mitigation, and I really think there is an opportunity to integrate the messages in the same way we would integrate nutrition messages um, but those messages into the extension, the last mile efforts that we're talking about, getting research out to you know, the farmers, but also making sure those messages around land management and even landscape management, not just plot management, but we know that you know, the, the improvements in landscape management can really um, make the efforts in getting improved varieties and fertilizer that much more effective. So I would have loved to hear <laughs> your thoughts and comments on that, but I just wanted to make sure that I just slipped that into this broader picture. Thank you. I'm so you. glad that this came in, Julie, because this is so important. Because this is this is about this is about the natural resource base on on, on which we on which we all uh, live, right? So, colleagues, big tent, inclusive innovation, scaling, last mile, uh, systems thinking, partnerships, bundling of contributions. That means technology adoption enhancing or adoption enabling services there are many of them that farmers need and uh, of course the policy and institutional changes i think that we would agree that we can neither afford to lose nature in the quest to feed people nor the many opportunities to improve livelihoods incomes and diets in a reimagined approach to agri-food systems renewal and innovation such as the ones that are being proposed under one CGIR with reference to our 2030 research and innovation strategy. I'd like to leave you with that thought. Thank you very much for your con uh, contributions. An applause round for the panel and we'll close the session. Thank you.